Hi, and welcome to this lesson on path loss and EIRP. Notwithstanding the title, what this lesson is really about is the question at the top of this slide. In a particular radio link, how much power can be delivered to a receiver? Previous lessons have been building up to this question. We know how to compute the power density from a transmitting antenna. And we know how to compute power received by a receive antenna. And we know a lot about how radio waves move power between points. But now what we want to do is put this all together. The direct answer to the question is something called the freeze transmission equation. And the first thing we're going to do is derive this equation for free space propagation. This will lead us to two concepts that show up a lot in radio link engineering, and which lead to the title of this lesson. The first concept is path loss, which is a very handy way to describe power transfer in a radio link in a way that's independent of antenna gain. And I'm going to explain a very common misconception, which is to confuse the concept of path loss with the concept of spreading loss, which has come up in previous lectures. The second concept is effective isotropic radiated power, EIRP. And this is a convenient way to specify power limits in practical radio systems. Now, all that will do in the context of free space propagation. I'll wind up this lesson by showing you how this can be generalized so that it applies to any type of propagation, including propagation which involves multipath and propagation where absorption along the path of propagation is significant. Okay, let's get started. Here's a cartoon of a free space radio link, as well as definitions of the parameters that we'll use to describe this link. Going from left to right, we have the power, P sub T, applied to the transmit antenna. The transmit antenna has a gain G sub T. Now, remember, gain is directivity times efficiency. So if an antenna loses some power before transmitting it, we've got that covered. Also, I say here that gain is unitless, but of course we can also describe antenna gain in units of dBi, simply by taking 10 times log 10 of the unitless quantity. The receiver is separated from the transmitter by distance r. And, as noted in the cartoon, we expect to see power density go down as r goes up. And that's because power is going to spread out along the expanding wavefront. The receive antenna has a gain g sub r in the direction of the arriving wave. Once again, we've got losses internal to the receive antenna system covered because we're using gain as opposed to directivity. Now, the final thing we'll need to specify is frequency. For this work, it's actually more convenient to think in terms of wavelength. Of course, that's no problem because wavelength is simply phase velocity divided by frequency. Remember, phase velocity here is going to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Now we have everything we need to answer the question at the bottom of this slide. That is, what now is the power, P sub R, delivered to the receiver? The approach we're going to use is illustrated by the equation now appearing on the right side of the slide. That is, P sub R is the product of the copolarized instant power density, S super I sub CO, times the effective aperture of the receive antenna, A sub E. Now, remember what's assumed when this equation is used. First, we're counting only for copolarized power, and to the extent that the polarization of the receive antenna does not match the polarization of the incoming wave, we're going to lose some power. Also, we're assuming that the input impedance of the radio is conjugate matched to the self-impedance of the receive antenna, so that all the power that the antenna can capture is delivered to the radio. Now, of course, both conditions are never exactly satisfied. But it's pretty common for the resulting error to be small compared to other errors that we may encounter when we analyze these links. If we were to find that this error is really important, well, then we could make refinements to this equation to account for those errors. It's relatively straightforward. But for now, let's keep things simple and assume that the conditions apply. To make progress, we need to get P sub R in terms of P sub T and G sub R. From previous lessons, we have the two equations that we need to do this. First, in free space, the power density can be calculated as the total radiated power divided by 4 pi r squared, this being the power density that you would get if the transmit antenna were isotropic and lossless, 
and then we multiply that by g sub t to account for the actual gain of the transmit antenna. Second, as shown in the equation on the right, we know that the effective aperture is related to the gain of the receive antenna by a factor of wavelength squared divided by 4 pi. Now we do the substitution and arrange some factors, and what we get is now shown at the bottom right of the slide. Received power equals transmit power times the gain of the transmit antenna times a factor which accounts for range and wavelength times the gain of the receive antenna. Very simple. This equation that we've developed is known as the freeze transmission equation for free space. As promised earlier, this equation tells you the received power given the transmit power, the frequency, that is via wavelength, distance, and the gains of the antennas. This equation is exactly what you want for analysis and design of radio links. Now, note that the equation includes a factor of wavelength divided by 4 pi r quantity squared. It's convenient to give that factor a name, and formally that name is path gain. But almost nobody calls this path gain. Instead, we define the reciprocal of this quantity, and we call that the path loss. So here you go. We define L sub P naught to be the reciprocal of wavelength divided by 4 pi r quantity squared, as we've shown here. And we refer to this quantity as free space path loss. So now we have a compact way of writing the freeze equation, and that's shown at the bottom of this slide. What the equation says is received power equals transmit power times the gain of the transmit antenna divided by path loss and then multiplied by the gain of the receive antenna. Very simple. Now for a word of caution. The concept of path loss is frequently confused with the concept of spreading loss, and these two things are not the same thing. To make this difference clear, here's a quick reminder about spreading loss. Spreading loss is the decrease in power density with distance. Now to see this, consider two distances, r sub 1 and then r sub 2, which is greater than r sub 1. The power density is less at r sub 2 than r sub 1 because the wave spreads out power with increasing distance. And we can calculate this. Let's say the power density at r sub 1, we'll call that s at r sub 1, is the numerator of the expression now on your screen. s at r sub 1 is equal to the transmitted power divided by 4 pi r sub 1 squared times the transmit gain. Similarly, let's call the power density r sub 2 s at r sub 2. We get the analogous expression in the denominator of our expression. The ratio of s at r sub 1 to s at r sub 2 is the power density at r sub 1 relative to the power density at r sub 2, that is the spreading loss. So now doing the calculation, we find that many factors cancel, and so we end up with the fact that the spreading loss is r sub 2 over r sub 1 quantity squared, as indicated on the right. Now it's clear that what we've defined as path loss from the freeze transmission equation is very different from spreading loss. In particular, note that path loss depends on wavelength, and that means frequency, whereas the spreading loss depends only on distance and not at all on frequency. So what do we make of this? Well, the frequency dependence of path loss entered into our analysis when we replaced the effective aperture with the receive gain. Go back a few slides for a reminder about that step. So the wavelength dependence of path loss is really just accounting for the relationship between receive gain and effective aperture, and really has nothing to do with the loss between antennas. And this is where people get confused. So here's that point again. Path loss is not the loss due to spreading over distance, although it certainly accounts for that. Think of it this way. Path loss makes sense only in the context of the freeze transmission equation. And specifically, it accounts for the frequency dependence of the gain of the receiving antenna. Not the gain of the receiving antenna per se, but only the frequency dependence of that gain. Now that we're clear on this, we can also make one other conclusion. Since path loss is proportional to wavelength raised to the power minus 2, 
path loss is proportional to frequency raised to power plus 2. That is, path loss increases in proportion to frequency squared. So yes, path loss increases with frequency. Here's something else that comes out of the freeze transmission equation. The first two factors in the equation are transmit power, P sub t, and transmit gain, G sub t. The product of these two factors has units of power, that is, watts. We call this product the effective isotropic radiated power, abbreviated EIRP. You can see just from inspection that EIRP is the total power that an isotropic antenna would need to radiate in order to produce the same power density, that is the same number of watts per square meter, as the actual antenna in the actual direction at the same distance. Now, this may seem like a strange thing to give a name to, so why bother doing this? Well, here's why. In radio link engineering and in spectrum management, we frequently want to be able to specify power density. The problem is that power density depends on both g sub t and r. And that's awkward because then we would also have to specify these things. However, if we instead specify EIRP, then this is essentially the same information, but it's independent of g sub t and r. That means just one value needs to be specified, as opposed to a value for every possible combination of transmit gain and distance. This is convenient. Despite being very convenient, the concept of EIRP is usually not intuitive to newcomers. So let me give you some examples of calculations using EIRP, and perhaps you can see why it's so useful. In these examples, we'll assume that someone, perhaps a spectrum regulator, uh, has required that our transmit station not exceed 100 watts EIRP. Then let's say the transmit gain of our antenna is 6 dBi. Now given those two numbers, how much power are we allowed to apply to our antenna? Well, the answer is 25 watts. The calculations shown here, 6 dBi is about 4 in linear units, so the maximum allowed power is EIRP divided by 4, which is 25 watts. Now, if the regulator had instead specified transmit power, you can see that there would be no limit to the power density that we could put into the world. We could just keep increasing the gain of our transmit antenna. By instead upper bounding EIRP, the regulator now knows the maximum power density that we can create at any distance R, regardless of the antenna that we've decided to use. Here's another example. Maybe I want to reduce the overall power consumption of my transmit station by reducing transmit power. Let's say I reduce transmit power to 5 watts, but maybe I still want to maximize the range under that constraint. Well, the freeze equation says I maximize range by maximizing EIRP, and transmit gain is EIRP divided by transmit power. So the transmit gain should be 20 in linear units, which is 13 dBi. So, I know I should start looking for an antenna with 13 dBi gain. Note that in these two examples, that I, as the owner of the transmit station, retain the freedom to trade off transmit power and transmit antenna gain. And at the same time, the spectrum manager can be assured that I'm not exceeding the geographical power density limit that they had in mind. Now another nice thing about the freeze equation is that it generalizes in a convenient way from free space to more complicated propagation environments. All you need to do is come up with the appropriate replacement expression for the path loss, and everything else can stay the same. So let's continue to refer to L sub P naught as the free space path loss, and we'll refer to L sub P, that is without the naught, to refer to the generalized path loss. What I'm showing now is a very common generalization of the path loss. In this scheme, we define a breakpoint distance, which we call r sub naught. Now, if the range r is less than the breakpoint distance, r sub naught, then we say the path loss is equal to the free space path loss. Nothing's different. But if r is greater than r sub naught, then we say that the path loss is equal to the free space path loss at r naught, and that the additional loss is merely the spreading loss which is 
R divided by R naught, quantity to the power N. In this scheme, if you choose N equals 2, then again nothing has changed. You still have the free space model. If, on the other hand, you choose N equals 4, then you now have the famous two-ray terrestrial path loss model. If you have not heard of this model, check out another lesson that I did on this topic. The title of that lesson is Propagation over Flat Earth. Of course, n need not be equal to 2 or 4. In practice, we see in measurements that sometimes n equals 3, or perhaps n equals 5 is more appropriate. In fact, n need not even be an integer. The bottom line is that this is a very flexible way to make the freeze equation work in a commonly encountered propagation environment, which is somewhat different from free space. Now appearing at the bottom of the slide is yet another generalization of the path loss model. In this case, we say the spreading loss goes in free space, but there is an additional factor of e to the 2 alpha r. If alpha is 0, you get the free space model. By making alpha greater than 0, then you're modeling absorption of power into the medium through which the wave is traveling. A common application of this form of the model is to model terrestrial radio links operating around 60 gigahertz. 60 gigahertz is special because at this frequency the air itself absorbs power directly from the wave. In this case alpha turns out to be something like 1.3 inverse kilometers, so you end up with additional path loss of something like 11 dB per kilometer. That brings us to the end of the lesson. Let's review. The free space freeze transmission equation tells us the power delivered to a receiver given transmit power, frequency, distance, and antenna gains. A very useful result unto itself. Out of the freeze transmission equation comes the concept of path loss, which tells us how received power varies as a function of distance and frequency. And I cautioned you not to confuse the path loss concept with the concept of spreading loss, which, among other differences, does not depend on frequency. We talked about EIRP, which is simply the product of the transmit power and the transmit antenna gain. This gives us a simple way to specify power density limits in a way that does not require us to dictate limits on transmit power or transmit antenna gain. I should disclose also that there's a very closely related concept known, confusingly, as effective radiated power, or ERP, that is, without the I. ERP is defined as EIRP divided by the directivity of a half-wave dipole, which is 1.64 in linear units, or 2.15 dBi. ERP is sometimes favored because EIRP is defined with respect to the mythical isotropic antenna, whereas ERP is defined with respect to the totally realizable half-wave dipole. There is no fundamental difference otherwise, and you can go back and forth between these two definitions whenever you want, so long as you don't forget about that constant factor of 1.64 by which they are different. Finally, we generalized all of this to propagation conditions which are different from free space. And this was easy to do because all we have to do is modify the form of the path loss factor in the freeze equation. As an example, I showed you the common model in which path loss is modeled as free space up to a breakpoint distance, and then as having a modified spreading factor, or a different path loss exponent, as we say, beyond that distance. I also showed you how to account for material loss, which is a problem that shows up in terrestrial 60 gigahertz propagation problems. And, again, there are many variants of all of this, including path loss models that have multiple breakpoint distances, uh, combinations of spreading loss exponents and material losses, and so on. That concludes this lesson on path loss and EIRP. Thanks for listening.